You can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook using the handle at Bloomberg Live. Later in the program, we'll also be incorporating a live poll that'll appear in the polling box. You'll see the question pop up on your screen as we're talking, and please take a moment to register your response, and we'll discuss that uh, when we have the results. So let's get started with our first panel of speakers. Joining us this afternoon, we have Omer Bar Yohai, who is the CEO and co-founder of Eviation Aircraft, and he's joining us from Israel. Hello, Omer. Hi, Mark. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. We also have Thomas Ingalat, who's the CEO of Polestar and the Chief Design Officer of Volvo Car Group. And Thomas is joining us from Sweden. Hello. Yeah, hi from Sweden. Hi, Mark. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, Thomas, let's begin with you um, because you sit uh, at a very interesting place, which is the CEO of Polestar, which is um, has long roots uh, and a connection with Volvo, but is a relatively new car um, company in that it's it's creating a new series of electric vehicles. But you're also obviously the the chief design officer for Volvo Car Group. Uh, you know, um, also moving into electric vehicles and hybrids and things like that. But a very traditional company. So we were curious to talk with you about how the um, the 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 pandemic and all of the disruptions that it's caused um, has or hasn't changed the way you're thinking about both businesses, both this new company, which is, I believe, going to be rolling out vehicles to consumers uh, later this summer, uh, but also what lessons have you brought uh, from Polestar to, um, to Volvo um, and this traditional car company? Um, so first of all, uh, how has uh, how has your 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 situation as you prepare to roll out these new cars? How has that changed because of COVID nineteen, if at all? Well, for the situation at Polestar, us being exactly in February in the position where we had to start production of our new Polestar two, the first full battery electric car from Polestar. We were lucky that our production facility in China, Luchao, was actually just up and running again when our start of production uh, was supposed to happen. So we did not have the problem of a delay there. But of course, the whole supply chain has to be had to be built up again and uh, be secured. And with uh, communication and logistics problems at that point in time, that was not easy. Um, having said that, that we managed, and I think that was one of the learnings, you can manage things that you thought would be impossible to do under these circumstances. I think a lot of companies realized, wow, um, what you can actually, what, what difficulties you can cope with. We had to completely rethink the launch of the car. We obviously have now for a couple of weeks uh, a, a worldwide test drive up and running for, for this car. And how do you do that in a very different way where you cannot invite journalists to all fly in and do a, a conventional test drive scenario where you would in Spain, wherever, bring everybody together to, to run a big fleet of cars over a couple of weeks. We had to decentralize, send the cars out, have everyday Q&A sessions with the journalists driving in country X, Y, several Q&As at, uh, at the same day, and really activate our local teams in order to, you know, do what otherwise uh, we have would have done centrally. That all was a big change. Um, what we do not have to change is in a way our business model, because we very much were not only founded and started as a company to do embrace the electrification, we at the same time wanted to do new ways of um, business, direct to customer business, having e-commerce as a strong arm in our in our toolbox, and that of course became now highly relevant uh, and suitable in in these circumstances. 
being able to communicate with the customer in a direct way through the net, being able to sell cars online, having already had the idea that you would not ask customers to come to your place, but that you actually bring cars for test drive to the people, that you have pickup and delivery if you want to service your car. So that type of being in a, in, in a much more digital modern world, interacting with the customer was part of, of the of the start idea uh, for Polestar. We see that this is now very much picked up by the traditional OEMs. Everything that was questioned about our business model before, how do you think that a customer could be so, you know, not physically interacting with a brand, all that suddenly is not questioned anymore. Now it becomes almost essential for, for the traditional car industry to adapt to it and to pick up these ideas really, really quickly and execute them themselves. You're creating um, a new plane from the ground up. It's not a retrofit of an existing model. Uh, the Alice, I believe, is, is a nine seat designed to be a commuter plane, zero emissions, all electric. Um, you had introduced it at one of the key air shows, and then I believe you were planning to have its first uh, test flights this year. Um, how, uh, I guess the same question to you, how did this uh, pandemic change the way your business is operating and, and what's been the effect? Um, well, Mark, yes, first of all, um, we did present the Atlas at the Paris Air Show in 2019 and, and the, um, let's say the, the normal workflow would have sent us to test flying right about now. Um, or let's say after summer. And the, the pandemic has definitely uh, created challenges. I think much like uh, was uh, folded in the, in the description of uh, what I'm sure was quite a challenge for, uh, for Thomas and the team, uh, rebuilding the global supply chain around something like um, the construction of a production vehicle, a car, or in our case, building the Alice was extremely challenging. Um, we had over 160 subcontractors in 21 countries and getting them not just to work uh, in a synchronized manner around the program, but also to deliver on time and to be able to, um, to, to kind of bounce back at the time expected is is not doable. It's a part of the things that, uh, that just the, the sheer diversity uh, creates a, a huge challenge. Um, we do push our test flights a bit further into the future. But again, if, if looking at the way uh, Thomas described it, it doesn't really change the long term plan. Because I think we need to look at this challenge from two or three different perspectives. First of all, in the medium and obviously in the long term, we ask the fundamental questions. Do people need a sustainable uh, aircraft at their regional distance capability? And we think the answer is absolutely yes, maybe even more so after COVID. Um, then we look at, at uh, different aspects of the way we build a program. What's our relationship with our supply chain? Where do we manufacture? How do we contact our partners and how do we contact our customers. And there, I fully agree with the way Thomas described it. There are a lot of things that felt a bit avant-garde literally two minutes ago, and today seem very, very normal. I think that the pandemic really sharpened a lot of the trends that we've seen, um, especially around remote and dist distributed uh, operations around, um, for example, designing and working in the cloud. We had a very, very early stage decision, um, actually all the way back to 2015 when the company was uh, founded, that because we have so many resources that will have to be pulled globally to make this a technical success, we will design the entire aircraft in the cloud. 
And when it was first uh, done, we were one of the first companies to do so as, a, as an OEM that actually builds an, a full aircraft and not a subsystem. And it was perceived as a bit weird. I think today, obviously a lot of companies are shifting to that, but the, the, the fact that we can work on a single data set with engineers in different continents, different time zones, but also different uh, under a different umbrella of um, pandemic limitations. They can work from home, they can work from their offices, they can collaborate. So this uh, trend of working from a distance has dramatically uh, shifted and became obviously much more uh, real and much more common now because of the pandemic. Some of it will be uh, taken into the future, but yes, we did have some impact about the ability to deliver on time in the short term. Um, and, and one thing that I think is interesting is that we, I think we were forced to better define what could be achieved from a distance, what could be designed or uh, allocated, or even who could be hired uh, from a distance, but what events and processes actually demand that extra mile, again, sometimes literally extra mile, to put people in the same room despite the difficulties and with the different constraints, because that's the only way to solve a, a tricky problem or because there is some need. And I think this balance, this, uh, this, the fact that we have to decide about it make a, made, us, made us a bit sharper. Thomas, um, what though is lost when you are not together with uh, your designers or your engineers or others on your team? Um, and, and is that important? Is that something that you have found that you're missing by not being able to be all together in one room at some points in, in time? Well, Mark, it's a, it's, it's a very interesting situation. At the moment, we are almost all in a kind of a honeymoon with a new situation of working in this new way. The pandemic has forced us to do so, and it was really that big push. And now we discover, oh, wow, a, a lot of that is working. What we always thought, yeah, we should do it that way. We shouldn't you know, fly around and do all that. But we did, and now we have to work in a different way. And wow, it works. And it's actually pretty amazing and exciting. And I uh, get so many positive comments on people discovering how that works. Um, as for example, thinking about building a, a, a new factory where you have to organize people working on that factory totally virtually because they cannot fly there now. So they really, we need to work with, you know, video streaming of building this factory in terms of um, making it possible for people to to really do that so remote and far away, an engineering team in the UK working with people here in Sweden and uh, building a factory in China. That's all fascinating. And as I said, it's kind of a honeymoon situation, like everybody's really excited about it. But indeed, there is, of course, a factor at which we probably do not realize yet to the full extent how much certain elements of it cannot easily be solved and will be much more painful to indeed organize in a in a distant virtual way or maybe even prove to to be impossible and to have we have we have to invent something new all the teeny tiny bits of information that you actually do not get in an organized way but through communication that happens in the corridor at the coffee machine information that you even didn't know you were seeking but just by accident or um, it just happened to happen that you run into that this is of course not possible to organize um, easily with uh, conference calls getting very very streamlined dedicated information so i think there um, there will be still uh, that that type of um, um, oh, what do you call the morning after the party when you wake up with a big headache? I think th this waking up will, will still happen. And I think to, to solve those issues, then that will be still um, maybe the bigger challenge than what we had to face now, because what we do now, the tools were existing anyway. It's just that we were too, too not too lazy to use them so far. So there may be the real innovation in how we organize our work still has to come. 
uh, yes, that is an interesting point. Um, we are still in this bit of a honeymoon phase of the novelty of this and the, the ability um, to actually make all this work is still um, kind of remarkable um, to me. Um, but I, I wanted to go back to our theme about sort of innovation in this uh, this COVID world or post COVID world. If you, um, I'm not sure we're in the post COVID world certainly, uh, and, or when we will be. But I'm curious about how what lessons you may have learned now or or insights that you've developed at Polestar. How is that affecting your work at Volvo, and how is that changing the way Volvo? Um, is functioning or thinking about its customers or its design? Um, what 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 have you brought from Polestar to Volvo that uh, is most interesting to you? Now, one of the ideas about setting up Polestar indeed was to have this kind of cell where you develop ideas that can indeed influence then um, a big organization like Volvo and much faster than we thought these things have an effect. We even do not have to kind of implement it on purpose. It's happening automatically. Us having done a very radical way of reducing the options that a customer has in configurating their car. We call it taking, you know, the pain out of that process by, you know, life is full of difficult decisions. Why do you have to make another million decisions when configuring your car? So make it easy, very, very simple, clear packages, five steps, and boom, you are uh, ready with your car. Yet that for maybe a month up and running, and immediately, of course, colleagues at Volvo discovered how much that difference is and how much easier it is. And immediately it was carried over into the next car program with Volvo. And this is how it will be implemented now for their next car as well. So uh, that, that is indeed a very fast track of great innovation um, being highlighted here and easily picked up then. There are much more complicated things, of course, in the long run, how you do a direct consumer business. Of course, if you, if you have a very established organization with long history, IT systems and stuff, setting that all up will take longer. But um, definitely, as soon as you have a good example of how it can be, it's much easier to work along that way. Right, right. Now, Omer, you, um, I mean, building a car is one thing, and it's a, you know, it's a very obviously difficult um, process, uh, but you're creating an entirely new type of plane, um, and you're not yet at the point where um, you can begin to work with the regulators, I suppose, or, or maybe, you, maybe you already are in communication with um, regulators, but I wonder, you know, can you, can you get a, a new aircraft approved in, a, in this kind of virtual world? I mean, is that something that you would be able uh, to do without being in the same room in, in a meeting room in Washington, for example, working with the FAA. How do you envision that uh, process going? Well, first of all, we would better. <laughs> that's, a, that's our job right now. Um, yes, we are in, uh, I think, in a, in a very effective relationship with the FAA. Um, and I think that there is a, a level of understanding because the, the aviation industry, as you said, bringing a new plane to market, any plane, is, is a challenge. It's, um, it's done by a few companies, and those are usually um, fairly large and have the years of experience behind them. And, and by the way, it's a challenge for good reason. We don't want to see those things falling out the sky. Um, I think there is a unique mixture of uh, conditions here where we see a double challenge because of, of COVID, because of course the, the aviation industry is one of the worst hit industries. Um, we all feel it because we do not jet around and our vacation this summer is gonna look different. On the other hand, if you look at two things that are significant, the regulator cares about new programs I wouldn't say because they have time, they never really have time, because they have that kind of focus on what happens next and 
I think we're getting some some tailwind because of it. Uh, some of it has to do with the fact that uh, I believe we are, um, in a way, the aircraft that regulators would like to see uh, come to market as the first electric uh, representatives because they're uh, we look like a plane, we behave like a plane, we fly with existing infrastructure, and we can get by with most of the regulatory infrastructure out there. The other aspect of this, I think, has more to do with the like, regulators' position as part of society. If you think about it, regulators are usually huge organizations that serve the communities that are around them. The, the job of the regulator, be it the FAA, YASA, or any other major um, again, aviation industry regulator is to make sure that the product that they bring forward, that the industry bring forward is safe, but that there is product. And I think that in a way, COVID has made us rethink about a lot of things in our charter with our governments, with our environment, with um, the way we travel, so with one another. And Regulator, regulators are, maybe they do not lead that conversation, but they are definitely part of that conversation. So the ability to talk on a strategic level with the FAA and say, hey guys, this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying to achieve. We think it's great. They think it's great. Let's find creative, fast, and effective ways to bring this to market safely despite COVID, how great would that be? And I think we're getting um, more, let, let's put it this way, we're getting a far better response that we were uh, expecting. And, and that's a good place to be. We're obviously missing, and again, reflecting on what was said, obviously there are things to invent or things to solve here. It's very hard to present a super complex uh, new set of systems and not to do it in a room full of engineers and, uh, and, and experts that can reflect on it together. There is something about that passive knowledge, that thing you wanted to know or you wanted to hear that you don't even know uh, how to ask about. That, that doesn't happen if you don't have that front uh, or face-to-face -face meeting. But the process can move. And I think that, again, our experience with the FAA, which is where our focus is, was that not only are they uh, back on track, um, they want to see this happen and they're willing to be very, very open for smart and effective ways to communicate the needs all the way up, obviously, to the things you have to do. So you have to do your flight test, you have to do your uh, documentations, you have to do your testing, that's fine. So let's find safe ways to do this COVID-wise, but everything else, let's figure out. It's probably still too early to really understand how a global pandemic will change uh, consumer behavior, but I think we can, you know, I'm sure you're already uh, both of you are already thinking through uh, what the longer term uh, changes may be. But in the aircraft space, for example, um, it may be that a nine seat plane is the kind of environment that people will feel more comfortable in rather than a giant, you know, um, um, 767 or um, do you have, you know, does your strategy for Alice, does that, and the, and the company beyond Alice, uh, the, the aircraft that you'll be developing beyond Alice, ha has that changed in the last uh, few months as you've thought about uh, what the longer term consequences may be? Um, I think that the simple answer is no. We believe there is room for an Alice in, in the world after uh, COVID, and there is actually room for Alice in the in in the world when COVID isn't gone yet, or God forbid, it takes too long to to get rid of. Um, some of it has to do with what you said that probably people will feel more comfortable flying something that's a bit smaller. I still think that if you look at the big picture here, the world will come out of this, and it will come out of this ramping up 
the aviation industry again, and we'll be using larger planes again as well because there is just a question of throughput. You cannot really uh, get so many people out of uh, LaGuardia um, with a with a nine seater. There isn't enough space in in the blocks of, of takeoffs and landings. Um, but does it make more sense for someone to take his family on a private flight or take his executive team um, flying somewhere with an Alice than it would any, any other aircraft? Absolutely. Uh, does it matter that there was uh, COVID in the development process? Not really. I think it matters before, it, it uh, matters during, but um, if you think about it, and, and this is, for example, something we're seeing, obviously now there's uh, far more cargo than there is um, passenger travel in terms of aviation. So does this mean that uh, it makes more sense to build cargo aircraft than it does passenger carrying aircraft? Probably not, because this is not a long-term development. So yes, there is a growth in cargo. It's true because more people buy through the online services and that's why goods move around and sometimes they move around uh, via airplanes because it makes sense to get them there quickly. Um, that was true before. It may have sharpened a bit now, but we need to be sure that this uh, midterm noise, as painful and as disruptive it, as it may be, doesn't really affect the way we look at what we believe is going to be the future. You need to paint that picture of the future. Now, if you have new data because of this pandemic, absolutely. Let's think right. about it. So I would say this definitely uh, pushed our executive team to imagine what the world's going to look like at the end of 2021, at the beginning of 2025. So we took different bites and kind of looked at it differently. Um, but if you ask me um, from, from the seat I'm in, we do not believe this will uh, make a significant shift to what we see as our strategy right now. Okay. Um, and, and Thomas, for you, how do you think consumer behavior will change in terms of car buying? Um, or if, if at all, do you think the pandemic, um, for example, accelerates the movement toward um, all electric vehicles? Uh, are you seeing that or, or, or something different? I very much believe that it will support the shift towards electric mobility. Um, our topic here, innovation, one thing is clear, um, as much as people in the beginning said, oh, when do we go back to normal? I think by now it's very much clear to everybody there is no way back to normal. There's only a way forward and that has to be a sustainable future. And especially when people now, you know, public transport gets a little bit of a hit, Personal transport has to shift towards zero emission mobility. Otherwise, we, we don't gain anything here. And people are more understanding that change is not all that threatening. Change can be something really uh, amazing to experience. We see there's very high demand um, from people who not the people that have driven already two or three Teslas, no, people who come first time to the electric car and learn all about it um, and are open to that. So I, I very much believe that that experience um, going to going to something that is different to, to the normality that we knew before COVID, uh, it will be a strong push for product innovation. I very much believe in that. Uh, Thomas, what is um, what is the one thing um, that you've given up uh, because of the pandemic that you miss or that you were happy to give up, for example? Um, do you miss anything about the pre-COVID world? Um, oh, wow. I definitely uh, I'm much quicker with telling you what I um, what I enjoy and I enjoy definitely having had the time to, I, I collected many more kilometers on my bike because I just simply go to work here back and forward for weeks after weeks, not being disturbed by traveling to China, US, wherever I was normally traveling. That definitely uh, I enjoy. <laughs> 
I miss okay. out on so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to present a new a new project that we have to um, our colleagues in China. And I definitely um, I'm very, very sad that I will not be able to do that personally being there uh, in a couple of weeks, but that I have to do that via video stream. There are certain okay. things that I like to do via not by video stream, but not being there to really be there with with the project and 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 show the the new the new car that we are having there. I, I really um, that that's that uh, that is not good. Right. Um, and Omar, yeah. what what do you miss, um, or what uh, what have you discovered that uh, you you were happy to give up uh, in in this pandemic? Well, unfortunately, on the give up, I'm not going to surprise you. Um, I couldn't be happier giving up uh, travel for the last couple of months. I've seen my family more. I ran more. I got to the office uh, with a bigger smile. But um, I think what I'm really missing, and that's, uh, if you ask me, that was at the, that, that was the undercurrent for every endeavor I've started in my adult career is that um, it's not even a eureka moment. It's a set of eureka moments that happen when a good team gets to a, you know, gets in a room and solves a big problem or invents a solution or creates something new. And that point where something is an input of a problem, and it comes to life as a set of solutions that someone can build a plan to and someone can work on and someone can really create a product out of eventually. Um, I'm feeling that that's something that's very hard to do from a distance. And right. we're constantly struggling to make this happen. And I believe that in some, some cases, and, and I have to say that on a, on a very personal level, I found I decided to, to not take the risk, but just climb on a plane and fly somewhere because I have to do it this way, do it right, and then go into quarantine for two weeks. So sometimes you just have to say, this needs to be fixed. Um, so I didn't quite give it up altogether. When we have to, we have to, but I'm, I'm thinking that it's that um, direct contact with, with talent and with problem solving that I'm missing. Right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, um, but I have really enjoyed uh, talking with both of you. Um, good luck with um, your your launches this summer, Thomas, and with continuing on with uh, Alice, Omer. Thank you again for joining us. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Pleasure. thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thomas. Tell Omar. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I'm going to be talking with John Herstick, the president of SaaS Business at PTC and the founder of Onshape and SolidWorks uh, for a conversation about shaping the future of manufacturing design. Thanks for joining us, John. How are you today? Mark, I'm doing great. It's great to be here. I uh, really enjoyed the first speakers today. Thank you. Thanks, John. So first, I'd like to get the audience involved here with uh, the poll question that we have uh, for today. A reminder, I think you can see it there now. It appears in the slide box on your screen and you can register your response now. So the question is, how has your business been affected by COVID-19? Devastated uh, beyond recognition, impacted, but now slowly rebuilding, um, or you gained a competitive edge. Uh, let's see how our audience is reacting. I think at the moment it is impacted, but slowly rebuilding is a pretty, it, it is more than half the audience, um, a few uh, devastated beyond recognition, which is obviously uh, a difficult place to be in. And about a quarter said they gained a competitive edge. So that's, that's interesting. 70% I think are now saying impacted, but slowly rebuilding. So uh, John, how does that square with what you've been seeing with your clients? Um, yeah, at Onshape. Well, I think we've been seeing a similar distribution perhaps, Mark, you know, where 
where there's a lot of people in that middle area. But I would add that, you know, everyone is going through some form of disruption, even the people who gain an edge or have more demand, more opportunity. That's a positive factor, but it's still a disruption. So 100% of people we see are changing or being disrupted in some way. What about your your own business? I mean, how how have you been affected by uh, by the pandemic? Well, in our own business uh, at PTC and at Onshape in particular, we're one of the product line businesses within PTC. We see COVID giving us both um, headwinds and tailwinds. So you know, so to speak, there's there's positive factors and negative factors. On the negative side, you know, we sell to the world's product developers and uh, manufacturers, and of course, many of them, as you see in the survey, there's some that are going through horrible times, going out of business. Others are working hard to rebuild, and and so the the economic impact on the economy overall is felt by us as a negative. On the other hand, we have enormous tailwinds created by COVID because we supply tools. In my unit, the SaaS unit with Onshape, we are the the um, only full cloud, fully SaaS tool set for product developers in our market. That's what we built with Onshape. And so we have a new appreciation in the market. An advantage for us is the market is suddenly saying, wow, we really value a full cloud, full SaaS solution. We really value the the advantages it gives to remote and distributed work, to agility, to innovation. And so in that sense, the market has uh, um, given us a, a tailwind due to COVID. And we think the headwinds will go away as the economy recovers, but the tailwinds, the positive factors for Onshape and for PTC are here to stay. When you and I were talking a bit earlier before uh, we came on camera today, we were talking, uh, you said something I thought was was quite striking, which is agility is is the premium at this point. Um, that yeah. That is a critical factor in, 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 in implementing the innovation um, that you may have come up with. What do you mean by, by agility is the premium? Um, I think that that companies are realizing that no matter what's going to no matter what's around the next corner it's going to involve something that they didn't expect and so they've put a big premium on their ability to rethink and you heard our earlier speakers talking about rethinking supply chains a bit rethinking how teams work together and so so i think what is going to stay is a realization what's going to be a constant is a realization that there are a few constants and while before you might have said, hey, we'll set up our supply chain for cost optimization or quality optimization, you know, that would have been, and we'll lay that in place and, and know that we're getting the best price. Today, I think people are going to lay it in place and say, we need to know we're going to be agile. We need to know that if something happens in this country, it's going to disrupt our supply chain that we can move somewhere else. We need to know that if this product, um, enters a market that suddenly changes due to something, we need to be able to respond to that much more, much faster. So there's a big premium on agility. It's like like looking at athletes. Sometimes you look for athletes that are powerful and sometimes you look like, you know, in any sport for people who can move around quickly. And right now, you, you still need all the skills, you still need all the attributes, but there's a much bigger premium on agility now. Well, one thing uh, that I learned um, looking into your background that I'm I'm not sure a lot of people know uh, is that you're actually a, a champion blackjack player, right? Uh, and you started playing, yeah. was it competitively at MIT? Um, which I just think is such an interesting kind of window into someone uh, yeah. and their personality. But how has, um, you know, ha has no, being an expert in blackjack, um, has that uh, changed the way you do business overall or changed the way you think about business in, in say, a pandemic, for, for example? Well, Mark, yes, it's true. I was on the MIT blackjack team and we were a team of people who played blackjack professionally using only legal techniques to just just play with skill and win money. And if you've seen, there's a movie, um, there's a movie, there's a couple of books, there's a bunch of TV shows about it. Um, if you've seen any of those, the, the movies, the movie and the books 
have truth in them, but also a lot of fiction. So I want to make it clear that some of what you saw in the movie is fictional and wasn't anything I was involved in. Anyway, it was a great experience. We won money. We learned a lot. And I did learn things that helped me in business generally and to a lesser degree during COVID. Generally in business, I learned about how to think about what the long run truly is versus small sample sizes. I constantly see people in business taking a small sample of data and overgeneralizing. Um, whereas in blackjack, I learned that the long run is longer than most people think. You know, I also learned um, a little bit about innovation and entrepreneurship. I learned that that um, when I started playing blackjack, many people, most people around me told me it was a bad idea and gave me a long list of reasons why it would never work. And it turns out it was a good idea and it worked great. And it taught me a lesson that just because a lot of people think something is a bad idea doesn't mean that it is a bad idea. It might be a good idea. And then blackjack taught me um, improvisation, think on your feet, because things come up in the casino that you didn't anticipate and you have to respond to those. And that is really good training for the current climate um, where, where you have to, to imp improvise and you have to work as a team to figure out what to do in a changing situation. That was always true in business to a degree, but like an earlier speaker said, you know, the, the things we're learning in COVID, they were there, the tools that we're using, they were there. It's just, we weren't pushed to use them as much. And now we are. In, in following up on that idea of improvisation, has anything surprised you um, in terms of what your clients have been asking for? Um, has anything, you know, um, really stood out as something that you did not expect? Um, well, one thing that surprised me, Mark, from our clients is what they're not asking for. You know, what's interesting is mm -hmm. With the cloud, you know, we're we're a fully cloud, full SaaS system. We're the only one in our market. You might find that hard to believe, but you know, cloud is sort of a new thing. And you you noted our earlier speaker, Omer, felt the need to tell this audience that they had done something bold. They had put their designs in the cloud. Well, I don't think that a lot of industries would find that bold. You know, younger people would say, "What? You know, you know, what do you mean? Why would that be a special idea?" Well, and so anyway, um, one of the things that are that has happened is surprisingly how well cloud has proven to work surprise not to me surprising but to a lot of people it works so well that no one's even talking about how well it works you know the, the the cloud the internet if you had said six months ago four months ago hey the world's going to go home and everyone's going to video conference everyone's going to be using cloud tools all the time What's going to happen to the internet? People would have said, well, I don't know. It wouldn't hold up to that. Would it? Well, it's held up great. It's held up so great. No one's talking about it. So what's interesting and surprising is people aren't, aren't saying, aren't even, you know, um, it, what's happened is cloud is now the new reliable and the new normal. Cloud tools are working. They're easy to use. Whereas if you had installed software on that big workstation back at the office where the engineering office is, uh, well, how's that working out for you? Not well. And, you know, so all of a sudden it's the installed software systems. So customers are asking us, how quickly can we move? You know, we were talking to you six months ago, but now we really want to talk to you, you know, or they're, <laughs> they're now saying we didn't, we didn't understand before what the difference was between full cloud and just, you know, and partial cloud, you know, where, where you know it's one thing to just sort of copy files to and from cloud servers, but that doesn't really improve the way your team works as much as using a full cloud, real-time system. So they're saying, hey, we get those differences. How fast can we move? Right, right. Well, thank goodness can for I the internet so thing? we can have the... Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, one, one more thing if I can. They're also saying how can... One thing our customers are asking us more these days is, how can you help us change our process in the way we work? How can you help us adopt a more agile process? How can you help us be more innovative? We don't just want to take the old software we were using and start using Onshape because it's cloud-based. You know, the, it, we, we don't want to work the same way we're working. We want to adopt Onshape and use it to work differently. Can you help us with that? Can you tell us how we could get our workers to think differently? That is right. a really interesting thing happening. Right. 
Well, thank you, John. Um, we've run out of time here um, before we head over to our next conversation, but I want to thank you for joining us uh, from Boston. So thanks. Mark, it's a pleasure um, and, and uh, see you in person soon. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Miller, the global editor of Bloomberg Live. I'm based in New York, and I want to welcome you to this. Sorry about that. Uh, had a little bit of a glitch there. Um, what I wanted to say was that uh, for a deeper dive into some of the areas that John and I were just talking about, you can take a look at a survey from Onshape called the State of Product Development and Hardware Design, which you will find in the Q&A box on the handout tab on the lower right hand side of your screen. Uh, and for our next session, uh, I want to introduce Bloomberg's Emily Chang, who is gonna be speaking with Ellen Kuhlman, the CEO of Carbon, about accelerating change to meet the adapted economy. And over to you, Emily. Thank you, Mark. Hello and welcome, everyone. I am delighted to be joined by Ellen Coleman, the CEO of Carbon, also the former CEO and chair of DuPont. Ellen, thank you so much for joining us. Carbon is a really interesting company, basically a 3D printing company that's making parts for companies ranging from Adidas to Ford. Tell us more about what exactly Carbon does. You know, it's it's I love manufacturing. I've grown up in manufacturing. And when I saw Carbon's technology, it really came home to me that, you know, digitization has changed everything about business, right, in the new digital era, but not manufacturing. But Carbon's technology is very unique. It's able to manufacture polymer parts at a scale at a cost that matters in the manufacturing world. And so I'm very excited to be part of the team to really take this uh, technology to scale. So talk to us about the range of products that you're making and the range of companies that you're making these products for, everything from bicycle seats to teeth straighteners. Yeah, so if you think about polymer, it's everywhere, right? It's in consumer products, automotive products, industrial, medical. And so there are many different market segments that the technology is, is very relevant to. Dental is one of our largest segments. If you think mm -hmm. about now the digitization of how your teeth need to be aligned and then the printing, right, of the molds that thermoforming uses to create the liners. If you think about dentures and being able to have a digital file to print dentures out of polymer materials. And so when you lose them, you know, you can just reprint them and you don't have to go through the entire fitting process again. So having the designs in the cloud, being able to print them on command um, has really opened up a lot of new opportunities in dental, in medical, and, and think about consumer. Adidas is one of our largest customers. Uh, our printers print a midsole, a lattice, a design that's not moldable, and normally midsoles are molded. And it's a very unique design that allows their designers to be very creative and actually create performance feature in that the lattice absorbs energy. And so we're into consumer applications, medical, dental, industrial, Lamborghini and Ford are both customers printing parts. Um, and so it's really a very uh, diverse technology that is capable of a wide array of uh, different kinds of products and applications. Now, how did the pandemic impact your business and your processes? I mean, did the supply chain on your end completely seize up? Well, you know, we were watching it very closely as the pandemic started to develop. And then in here in California, the local laws, right, and the county laws in the state. In the middle of March, we had to shut down all of our work. We had to shut down manufacturing, shut down our laboratories within a 12-hour period. Um, and so we were absolutely complying. The only things that were allowed to occur in our labs or in our manufacturing was things that were medically oriented, that were necessary in order to be able to address the pandemic. And so very, very quickly, we started thinking about the power of 3D printing, about the ability of it to locally produce. We have close to a thousand printers out across the world. And, and, and how can they help in alleviating some of the shortages of the pandemic? The first thing we did very quickly was face shields. We hosted a webinar for our production partners 
and our customers to here's a file, here's how you make a face shield or print a face shield. Here's the, how you get the PET to be the other part of it besides the frame. And really within days, within a week, uh, we had customers printing face shields. Over 350,000 have been produced. Um, and those have been either donated or sold into first responders. Um, we partnered with Adidas and we donated um, thousands of shields into communities that were really in need, uh, like the Navajo Nation and others. And so that we could do very quickly. It's not a, a tough technical um, uh, product, a face shield. Uh, but then we moved into things that we, we had seen that were a much larger issue. For instance, the ability to test, you need swabs. And swabs were in a shortage. We, can, um, we designed a nasopharyngeal swab um, that was able to get you know, the specimen required, work with the testing equipment, you know, was tolerable to patients. And that took weeks, right? Not a week, but weeks, because we had to work with a, a in vitro diagnostic medical producer. Um, um, and in our field, we had to bring the designs into a clinical setting like Stanford and, and Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston and see how they worked in patients and, and compare them with the swab. So that was a longer, longer, you know, took a, a month, six weeks to get that up and running. But Resolution Medical is a tremendous partner uh, for us in doing that. So, I mean, the good part about it is it gave our people purpose. It really helped our community rally around how we could help in terms of alleviating some of the shortages in the pandemic. So are you still producing face shields and nasal swabs at that pace, given that now we are seeing a resurgence of COVID-19 around the world? So Resolution Medical works with our uh, contract partners in order to get the the swabs done. So that is still going on. There's still opportunities there. The face shields, it's episodic now. Um, the interesting thing is that the, the need for them died down in the late June, early July timeframe, but now we're seeing renewed requests coming in for that. So we're really taking a look at that and understanding where there are shortages and how we can help. Now, if 3D printing is possible, why should there be shortages of anything anywhere? Because that's not how the supply chains are arranged today. Supply chains have been globally optimized to deliver the lowest cost. So that means consolidated factories in certain parts of the world that then ship product uh, globally. Now, when you have disruptions um, due to the pandemic, we had disruptions not only in um, in transportation, but in the ability for these plants to get their raw materials, to have workers to convert. And that's where the localization of 3D printing showed the agility to be able to respond to these needs. And it really has us and others thinking about how should our supply chains look in the future? How much resilience do we need to build into it to be able to address these types of things as they occur in the future? So how do you see then supply chains evolving as a result of some of these learnings? Obviously, so many supply chains go back to China. Yeah, we see uh, different companies are thinking about it different ways. It's very interesting. People in the medical area are you know, engaging much more in understanding how do they get their designs in the cloud, right? So that it's not just in tooling located in one factory, but can they do the work now to create the digital footprint that gives them more optionality in the future. And if they have that optionality, how do they deploy it? Do they need to have partners not only in Asia, but also in, in every continent, right? Where their, where their supplies are required. And so those discussions are happening. I, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. We see many industries thinking they'll just go back, um, you know, because these are kind of a, a you know, a black swan event, you know, how often will they occur? And, um, and so that debate is, is really, um, we're in the midst of it right now. And I were watching it very closely and participating, as you can imagine. So how do you see this changing your business and the 3D printing industry in general, as a result? You know, it's, it's interesting, because we are um, the first 3D printing company that's moved into manufacturing. You know, 3D printing had a lot of promise. It's been around for decades and it's been used mostly for prototyping and for small runs. 
So we, with the advent of our technology, its speed, its capability, have been able to print millions, right, of parts at a cost that matters. And so we're just at the front end of that type of transition and understanding where is it most relevant. Clearly today, it's relevant where we can create unique designs that are unmoldable so that they can really impact from that standpoint. And so it is, I think, uh, up to people like us in the industry to really look at how we can deliver down those supply chains in a manufacturing environment at a cost that's relevant. So I think we are at a pivotal stage for the industry. Now, in your former role as the CEO and chair of DuPont, which is you know one of the biggest and most storied companies in American history, you know Dow Chemical merged with with DuPont. How do you think your experience there prepared you? for this moment that we're going through right now? You know, it's interesting because I was named CEO of DuPont in um, October of 2008, like right at Lehman weekend, when the markets were in free fall. And so I started the role in a crisis and you know, created um, kind of a, my playbook, my four uh, things that I really come back to in these kinds of times. And they, those have been, at my side right now and I'm working, you know, as I work with carbon and through this pandemic, those same things hold true. You know, first and foremost, it's focusing on what you can control. I can't control the environment, but I can control how we engage in that environment and the pivot to making PPE and making nasal swabs is something we could do to help. I mean, the second is you just can't communicate enough to your employees, to your customers, to your supply chains about what's going on about what's important, about what we're focused on. And so, you know, I've been holding daily, you know, stand-up meetings with my staff so that we can respond very quickly. You know, we hold every Friday. We still do Friday lunches. We're just doing them, you know, on a teleconference as opposed to in person to engage with our community, with our employees. I mean, I really think it is also that we're not going to return to the previous normal. And so, Moving into a new environment post-COVID, we've got to create a new trajectory. And I've got the team working on that now. Medical, obviously, will be a much larger opportunity for us than we were thinking before based on what we learned through COVID. And there'll be other changes like that. And I think, lastly, it is about really maintaining that sense of mission, focusing our teams on the mission of the company and how we can really be part of the future. And I think those are the four things that I keep coming back to that not only helped me at DuPont through whether it was the global financial crisis or other things that occurred, but have clearly benefited me in, uh, in my work with carbon through this environment. You were also the first woman to lead DuPont in its 212 year history. And obviously we know that there's something missing when women aren't at the table and certainly women leaders. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that in a time of crisis, we've seen countries with female leaders like Germany and New Zealand and Taiwan excelling at managing this. If you just look at the numbers, what do you think that shows? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. And, you know, there's a lot of theories on this and I'm not, you know, I'm not a student of all the studies, but I think there's a resilience um, that many of my peers and I talk about is that, you know, we've come through and become leaders based on, on our resilience, on our ability to handle ambiguity. And these are certainly times when uncertainty is just raging. And so the ability to handle that ambiguity, I think is a really important part. In my experience, I see many women that have that capability and can really use that in terms of being able to, you know, um, create the pathway through and getting to the new future. So, how are you thinking now about the distribution of work at your own company? You've got Google telling employees they can work from home until next July. You've got some companies like Twitter saying employees can work at home forever. You know, cases are resurging. Schools aren't reopening. You've got a lot of parents. I'm a parent. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do uh, if my kids don't go back to school this year. How is that changing how you are structuring the work at your company? Yeah. So you know, first and foremost, a lot of our work can occur outside of the, of the office. And so we are actually taking a look at, you know, at the workflows, where it can be done. How do we keep the connectedness in a disconnected world? Because that's really important. 
certainly our material scientists, our hardware engineers need to be in the office to get their work done. So if we have 400 people in our company, we maybe have less than 100 back at the office or at, in our you know in our labs on two shifts to be able to get that work done. I, I visited them yesterday. I bought them all lunch um, and uh, just listened to them and how they were experiencing the work. And it's you know it is a very different work environment, and you really have to figure out how to stay connected and how to you know to to continue to drive our culture through that. So we're going to be working remotely. We are very flexible. We have a lot of young parents um, who are in the same situation that you're in. And we have to realize that they, you know, in, my motto has always been, you've got to, if you take care of your family and your family's doing fine, then you're going to be a much more productive employee. And we've got to, we've got to honor that and help our employees in any way we can through this time. So there's no question that talent will be more distributed, perhaps forever. How do you think that will impact innovation? I really am concerned about that because I see so much of innovation occurs um, by happenstance, by just having that conversation that lights something up that says, wow, makes a connection that you hadn't made before. And those are hard things to schedule. Like, okay, I'm going to call you for 15 minutes and we're going to innovate. You know, that's, that's just not the way that in my experience, it really has worked. So we're now trying to figure out how to, keep those connections going in a distributed world? How do we create um, those environments where people can just, you know, the chat rooms, the, the you know, hey, let's, let's host a, a meeting and talk about, um, you know, materials and what, what kinds of things we need and allow anybody to come in and share. I mean, so we're really trying to figure out new and innovative ways to keep those connections going because I am very afraid that innovation will slow down as we all are in these disconnected, you know, spaces. Interesting. So do you think if, you know, and, and, and we've got the biggest tech companies in the world that are, are thinking about doing this for, for the long term, do you think that means Silicon Valley could be less innovative in the future? You know, I, I, one thing I know about Silicon Valley is that they change very quickly if they don't like what they see or if, they, if they're not sure the experience is going to um, enable them to still be innovative. So I, I see where, we, you know, where th these companies are today. I have a feeling that if they felt they weren't getting what they needed, that they, they change, right? And they would continue to move forward. That's how they've been so successful for so long. And I don't think that it's going to stop. So as we're seeing this resurgence around the world in cases of COVID-19, what are your biggest concerns given the uncertainty ahead? No, I do think that, you know, we have to, certainly the economy is a concern, but if the world's not healthy, the economy doesn't matter. If people are afraid to go out, to go to work because of a resurgence, then, you know, then it's going to, you know, we're going to have a double dip, a triple dip, or whatever. So I do think we have to make sure that we get health first and then continue to drive to bring the economy along and back as as the world gets healthy. And I just don't think you can have an unhealthy, great economy, right? I don't think those two things are going to go together. Um, who do you think the winners in the pandemic will be? Well, I think that, um, well, I think companies who've enabled this distributed work are certainly winning right now, right? I mean, um, you know, if you take a look at, you know, computer companies and, and, you know, the ability to connect companies and like Zoom and other of their competitors, I mean, I think they're seeing a large um, increase. You know, the amazing thing to me is you can't go out and, and get exercise equipment or bicycles because people are, um, are turning to these things as they have, you know, much more flexible time on their hands. So I think it's really interesting to see who the winners are now. I think the winners long term are going to be the companies that change their model to be relevant in the new world. And I think that's something we have an eye on very clearly to look at how local manufacturing and distributed manufacturing can really be an advantage in a very different world and continue to understand how we can be part of that equation. And who do you think is going to be left behind? You know, I think the companies that believe it's going to return to normal, whatever that means for them, or return to the way it was in the past. I don't think transportation's 
going to be the same. I don't think people are going to look at flying the same way for a long time. I don't think, I think there are other areas like that that are just going to, you know, evolve to a different space. Um, you know, I do think that large venues, large crowds are going to be something that's going to take a while to get back to. So I do think that there's going to be um, companies that kind of sit in, you know, the past are going to have a problem. And I just love the way they've revived drive-in movie theaters and drive-in concerts. So we sit in our car, right? And, you know, we open the windows and we're socially isolated from each other, but we can see a new movie or we can experience music. And um, yeah, I am old enough that I remember drive-ins from my youth. Um, but I just think that that kind of, you know, creativity and innovation is is going to be really needed for us to, to continue to drive forward. Now, as you look forward, I mean, part of your job as a leader is to, you know, think ahead, but there is so much uncertainty there. What do you think the world looks like in a year? And how do you plan for that? No, I, you know, in, in listening to all the work that's going on around vaccines and antivirals and in the medical community, um, I they believe it's going to be a long haul, um, but they believe that there's probably going to be light in the, in the second half, second quarter, second half of next year. So that I think it's going to be a rough road for a few quarters. But then, you know, as we get more immunity, as there are things that people can avail themselves of to protect themselves, that I think that things will start to evolve and start to move forward. You know, and I'm not going to use the word return to because I don't think it's going to return to. I think it's going to be different. But I think that, you know, we need to understand that th there is not a quick fix, that there's just not something that's going to make it go away, that it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort on the parts of a lot of people. And I think we have to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. All right. Ellen Coleman, thank you so much for joining us. That was a fascinating conversation. Ellen Coleman, the CEO of Carbon, thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you very much. We're gonna to have to leave it there. We have run out of time, but you can continue the conversation on social media at Bloomberg Live on Twitter or on LinkedIn. You can use the hashtag powering product. You can also learn more about our upcoming events at BloombergLive.com. I'd love to thank our speakers, our other participants for joining us and our sponsor Onshape for making this virtual event, event possible. And a huge thank you to our audience for joining us today. We hope you'll be back for another